Well so can you. we throw some questions straight at you, June? Is that yes, all right? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Great. Um, so really, um, what we wanted to do is obviously talk about the importance of co-regulation. Um, and there is an emphasis on self-regulation in development matters. But in birth to five matters, um, there's an, an, this term, co-regulation, the concept of co-regulation. And what we thought to start off with, it might be a really good idea if you could just talk us through what you would see as co-regulation. How would you describe co-regulation to someone? I think um, when you set the context and talk about regulation anyway, the, the term regulation is because it's associated with sort of behavior and being kind of behaving well it confuses people all the time and so I think um, it's a shame that we couldn't have thought of something better to describe it because um, uh, I think we're going to constantly have that battle of making have helping people to understand that co-regulation in my view is about like being like a pedagogue it's about walking alongside a child and helping them to find the way that makes them feel settled and okay and able to take things to the next step so you know when a child is in a having um you know a moment and um distressed about something a co-regulator is the adult or the the, the partner in, in that experience where they kind of hold their hands metaphorically often and and just allow them that space to kind of settle down and in a way almost articulate it you know early years teachers narrate what's happening for the for the children i think it's a kind of a narration it's a kind of saying you know we know you're feeling really stressed right now we know that you don't like the change we know you don't want to go in the garden but it's okay we can we'll figure this out between us and let, let's just let's just have a moment and let's just go into the into the den where you like to be and then we'll figure this out and it's just that kind of thing i think that we um and then we we give the fancy title co-regulation which then unnerves a lot of people especially in the early years because it's a title they're not comfortable with and therefore the natural instinct so many teachers will have is kind of slightly i think sometimes discombobulated by the framing of it in in terms that uh, make them think they should be doing something really but quite often you don't want to be doing anything you just want to be there you just want to be create that sort of safe space where you're just with them and letting them to figure this out but and so i think all of this needs a lot of time and a lot of thinking and a lot of clear um explanation to staff to make them feel able to behave in what is probably a very empathetic and and kind way I was going to say, is it sort of like instinctive, sort of empathetic yeah. response, really, yeah. that you've given to, as you say, a, a particular title that can... Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I think, and I think that, you know, it's got all very confused, and um, I'm, Helen will know this very well, but... Um, you know, on the Twitterati, <laughs> the uh, concept of self-regulation has become, you know, somewhat contested. And uh, if I was to say, you know, at times rather toxic, mm -hmm. and I think that creates fear as well. So people don't want to use it. You know, it's a bit like, you know, many years ago when people would talk about um, multicultural or diversity, they didn't know really what they meant by it. So they were always skirted around it and never actually addressed it. Um, yeah. And uh, I think we might find ourselves in a similar position here if we don't make it open and clear and give people the permission to 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 try and find their own way of describing it and then framing it what it really is rather than in the sense of it sit down and be quiet and and uh, you know um, fold your arms which is yeah. kind of how we were brought up oh yeah goodness. <laughs> <laughs> we're always folding our arms I tell you <laughs> sitting up straight and folding our arms yeah, like, yeah. Arms always arms. folding those arms um, and there's probably something in it you know you know because when you fold your arms you kind of hold yourself together don't you yeah. um you know and the other thing was did you have to put your head down on the desk yes that was another one yeah. children put your head down on the desk yeah and that i guess again in their own kind of queer kind of quainty way that was a, a, an attempt to kind of give you maybe a moment's peace yeah. 
Yeah, well, I think I got in trouble because I had my head on the yes, desk. Yes, yes, because I was <laughs> having a moment's peace when I should have been alerter than I was. But there we go. Yeah. It's, yeah. Not, it's about, well, yes, it, that's about control, isn't it? And it's yeah. not about regulation at all. It's just, yes, I completely understand. But interesting that you would say that about self-regulation, that you feel that people would be uncomfortable with that term is that what you were saying or feel there's sort of toxicity it's about a toxicity it. what do you think what what do you mean by that June because I use I'm a speech and language therapist and we with occupational therapists we're regularly talking about self-regulation and we're talking about zones of regulation alertness levels tools for regulation and so it's interesting to even think that that term might be a term that would be a bit controversial, toxic or toxic, toxic yeah. Well, I, I mean, that's my perception on it. I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what, what Helen thinks about this as well, because it's really because it came through, maybe it's because the association of where it's come from was through the Department of Education's kind of rethinking about what, you know, what, um children need and it was very much sort of perceived as the sitting still and being quiet it was very much perceived as the part of the sort of behavior management stuff now and i'm not suggesting that children don't need to find ways to manage their behavior or that we don't have to find ways to make sure that you know children have a have a place and there's some rules and boundaries don't get me wrong i'm not suggesting that at all but i think it was the way it was managed the communication was managed that it was sort of in a way swooped upon by people who thought my gosh they're now talking about them you know um being you know being quiet sitting still and it was in all of that was it was framed i think in the debate about children going to school earlier and earlier and i guess from us in the early years the anxiety quite rightly is they're really not ready for this sort of thing you know yeah. they're really uh this is imposing sort of rules on them and behaviors on them that they're not actually ready for so it's only going to cause more stress rather than reduce it and i think it was within the context of all of that mm -hmm. that the term self-regulation started to emerge and then it was kind of i guess it was the kind of um the, the word that described all of the emotions that was behind the scene and stuff you know what i mean and then i think everyone gets anxious about it now because maybe they don't know but you know people feel an anxiety around a term yeah, and then, uh, they pick up the anxiety rather than explore it and, and, and tend to, I guess, avoid it. Yeah. So it's quite important to explore that term because self-regulation is also becoming alerter. So it can be calming, but it also can be to try and encourage children to become more alert. So mm. it can be two ways. Yes. Can't it? It's not necessarily calming. No, it can be. I think that's everybody thinks it's about calming. But it can they? also be about and alerting. It's not, yeah, it's mm -hmm. finding that sort of place, isn't it, where you're, yeah. you're sort of at your most well, alert or yes, ready. You know, yeah, yeah, ready to go. Um, so Jude, little quote from Birth to Five Matters here, which is self-regulation depends on and grows out of co-regulation, where adults and children work together towards a common purpose including finding ways to resolve upset and stress in any domain and return to balance. But what happens to children who are not adequately co-regulated and how does this impact their ability to navigate their feelings, build relationships and all of that? You know, one of the things that seems to, me, to be missing in the rush to get people qualified these days is uh, a real attention to child development. Mm. Uh, a really old fashioned, back to basics kind of time to really pay attention to observing children and taking your time. You know, the days of Mary Sheridan are really short these days and I really would like to bring bring her back. In fact, we do. Uh, she is yeah. kind of essential at an all leaf training. Yeah. 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 And I think that's part, of, that's part of the problem. And I think what's happening is, there's kind of two two sort of approaches. One is how do children develop? And the second is how do children learn? And we ten, tend to kind of oscillate between the two instead of just kind of really paying attention to staff, understanding first the development stuff, and then on that, you know, how they how they learn. And I, I can hear people screaming now, going, you can't develop without learning. And I, yes, I know that. But, you know, it's, it's about understanding what's possible within that kind of, that yeah. sort of milestone space to then apply how the learning happens as a consequence of that. 
And I guess that's that's the first thing. And so therefore, when when these new this new language to to our sector, it's not necessarily new to other sectors, but when it's then applied, there's two responses. One is oh, we must go on a course. We must go on a course. Mm -hmm. And secondly, we must have a policy. And um, and then you kind of feel if Ofsted come, we we have a policy and 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 we have we've been on a course. And, you know, and I think when you do that without really understanding how children develop, without really paying attention to this core stuff, you get confusion, mm -hmm. you get ignorance, you get fear, and you get anxiety. Mm -hmm. Everything actually. <laughs> <laughs> that they're trying to address in this conversation about regulation, co-regulation, emotional regulation, however, la whatever language they want to to use to describe the story, really, of how do we understand children's development with regards to their emotions and how do we introduce a sense of stretch for them and a positive, you know, ability to manage stress, because that's important, mm. an acceptance that stress is actually not always bad and um and the sort of thing that the heckman equation talks about which to me is critical which is things like perseverance empathy yeah. uh, an ability to listen an ability to stick with things you know that stickability yeah. stuff and also an ability to um to in a way defer gratification you know to to to, to understand how to cope with it's coming in a while type thing. Yeah. But I think fundamentally we, we we jumped the gun by not actually, you know, on sort of paying attention to the development frame that in that we will be teaching children those kind of things. And I think that's part of the problem. And I guess um, if I had a magic wand, if I was the minister for the day, I would take everybody back to child development, everybody, mm. health visitors, yeah. um, you know, uh, teachers, uh, nursery staff, and actually make it a really essential part of everyone's training. I would introduce it in schools. I would have it the whole, you know, the whole kit and caboodle really at every level. Because when you understand that, you can then start to think about the more complex kind of learnings and the more complex, you know, um, it's sort of in a way transitions that need to be had to, to their various kind of next steps, next stages. Mm. Although I shouldn't say next steps because that's a dreadful thing, isn't it? That next steps where, you know, you can't even write up something unless you can find a next step. And I say to them, what about just letting them stay on that step for a bit longer and just absorb that and assimilate that and enjoy in that? And then we can get to the next step, you know, in a couple of weeks. What about that? What about practice, repetition, you know? Hey? <laughs> well, I think what you say is so good. And I think just understanding child development is so important, isn't it? And we, it's just, I think it's looking too at courses. I, I did a MA in early childhood education, thinking I would learn a lot about child development yeah. and I didn't. No, no. You know, if I wanted to learn about child development, I had to read Birth of Five Sheridan. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I, I so agree. And that's part of the reason we developed ARC was to actually give these resources and we've got a lot yeah. of Sheridan in our yeah, we have. <laughs> um, but yeah you're that, I think that's so true understanding children we need to understand child development and it's just so freeing when you do um, and exciting and exciting it's when people get so inspired isn't it when I st first started to understand the kind of child development I, it was all about language and you know how many words children heard all that kind yeah. of it was so exciting mm. and I and I before that I was sort of I don't know just was going in and doing my thing and it completely changed it for yeah me. I thought if there's that there must be something over in maths as well and there must be something over there and yeah actually sort of building up this picture of child development is so exciting and then telling other people things yeah that, and then saying I had no idea about that and that's the problem people have no idea about it just and those foundational, foundational things, things, like number sense yes. and all those things. It was just, yeah. it's so good to understand that, isn't no, it? It is, it's really exciting. Don't you think it's because everyone's in a rush? You know, um, you, you're doing the, they're doing their course and it's, it's all in a hurry. You know, when is the last time that, you know, people felt, people, I mean, teachers, uh, you know, uh, earlier staff, had time to just observe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, really observe. I mean, I don't mean like for something. You're always observing for something. You're collecting evidence for something. You know, you have to demonstrate their ability to do something. What about just watching them? How, you know, there's no more pleasure than just sitting in the corner of your, of a nursery room in a baby room and just watching those babies yeah. and just watching what they do and, and just letting them do it. And, um, you know, and, and, ex and just experiencing that. But then, you know, staff would feel guilty and they think, oh, we should be doing something with them. We should, no, I'm not suggesting that they should be there all day, you know, I'm not doing anything with babies by any means, but, but, you know, it's just that, just indulge it for, for a half an hour and just let them, you know, let them just, you know, just do, just be. And, yeah. and I just don't think we give we give permission enough for that sort of thing. Um, you know, we're always to a time or to a tick box or to a something and just having the confidence to just say, well, you know, this morning, I'm just going to watch the babies and see what, you know, where they're at. And then to be able to say, you know, you know, little, you know, Sally can do this. She's, I've been noticed how she's pulling her leg and go, and you go, yeah, that's really interesting. Do you think she's going to be a bottom shuffler? Well, that's right. She's around the right age. Can you imagine the interesting conversations you'd end up having yeah. with your colleagues and the kind of pedagogical confidence that would grow from that? Because you'd be saying, yes, do you think she is? That's really interesting because because Tommy isn't like that at all. He's really on his tummy, isn't he? He's really moving. And, and you know, the, and the joy you'd have that conversation with a parent when they arrive and go, you know, he's been aged just watching Sally today <laughs> we really looked at her we really saw what she was interested in and stuff did you know that and mum may well say oh yeah yeah at home she does a lot of that and you know when we just put her down just to just let her just sort of experience being on the floor whatever it is and yeah you have that or you have the whole kind of panic it's we must do this we must do that we you know health and safety must be careful we mustn't do this we mustn't do that we just lose it sometimes we just and i think if we knew more about how children develop and we were confident about knowing that we would be much more relaxed yeah oh, i agree and i think it's you know that we talk about owling observe wait listen and i think it's ah, you're, nice you're not you know it's active it's it not is. we're not being passive mm. by observing we're being no. by observing and it, it's a function it's not a withdrawal it's something that's really important to yeah. see you know, and I think until you do that, you're not going to really understand what your child is interested in. Oh, how exactly. Bond. There's so much on, um, really, uh, in observing. So we we really like Alan. Yeah, absolutely love Alan. I remember just actually when I got to that point in my career where I thought I did have that confidence just to go and watch and just be there with the child and just sit there. And I didn't care what anyone else thought because it was there was a point in me doing that. And I learned so much. So I couldn't agree with you more, June. And I would encourage anyone listening just to do that because it has the most incredible value. And actually, it's a really empathetic thing to do as well because you're just you can get really inside that child, really understand what's going on, and the sort of things that are interesting them or worrying them. Or it's brilliant. I think, yeah. I think and do you think the new framework actually has helped that without? You know having to focus on so much evidence on you know observations and writing this that actually the way the new framework is is laying things out it will encourage more of that ah uh, that's a that's a uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question so the new framework by its very nature is a framework therefore it's the risk of that is that people will teach to uh, what's within the framework yeah. And that's the risk. And um, to me, um, what's missing is uh, the support to the staff to become pedagogically confident. Because yes. I don't think it actually matters in, in to when you're pedagogically confident, you are able to make judgments like observing. You're able to make judgments about describing uh, the children. Say, um, I don't know. We yesterday, what were they doing? They were doing. Uh, they were using um, squirty, squirty, old squirty um, plastic um, containers to to draw lines all over the garden in uh, using um, some kind of gloop and stuff. And to, you know, the staff were describing that to uh, as you know, preparing them for for writing, sort of early mark making. You know, building the confidence in your hands, strengthening it. You know, pointing all of that stuff. And I just thought, well, to me, that was a really lovely example because 
it demonstrated them their ability to tell the story of what and why those children were doing that they gave them loads of time to play with it and then they you know if anyone came it would have really been um it would have been really interesting for them to come actually and hear the story of why they were picking on the children's interest they wanted to develop their wrist movement they wanted to give them an opportunity to squeeze they you know all of those things all that child development learning had come together and turned into a pedagogical moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's the language of this, and the confidence of that is what people need. And that will make it successful because a decent inspector or a decent partner in learning is going to want those conversations with you. They're going to want you to be able to explain. And, and we miss that. We don't have that. We don't have, um, we haven't got enough investment in, in, uh, in the staff generally across the piece. Um, we have about 319,000 and staff working in the early years sector particularly and um you know there is no proper guaranteed um pathway for them now that's not to say that organizations don't develop their own i'm not saying that at all um and that's not to say that uh you know it's possible for them to have pathways but there isn't a national structured well recognized solid well funded journey from arrival uh, to, 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 to MA. So at least I have that, we have developed that right from level one, I've got our own degree, we've just had a, uh, the top up is now so they can do their honours degree. So that you can come at level one, you can be uh, unqualified, you can become level two, you can then train to be a leaf teacher level three, you can become a Senko level three, you can do sustainability level four, you can do leadership level five, you can do a foundation degree level five, you can do a top up honors level six, and hopefully you'll eventually be doing an MA level seven. That is not, that shouldn't be dependent on my passion for my staff to, to allow that to happen and be supported or, you know, other very nice organizations that do similar things. It should be the right of everyone who wants to enter the sector of working with small children. Yeah. It should be honoured and funded and it should be um, really good calibre as well. And it should have solid, solid child development as its baseline. And that is not what's happening. Yeah. And that's 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 why you did the framework could be a framework of 50 points, two points, 10 points, 68 points. Yeah. And you've got a team of staff who feel able to interpret it develop it extend it and and translate it mm. you know both for themselves for their children and for their parents you were always going to be up against uh, a kind of deficit model that we can't deliver against these things and we must be the weak weak link in this and i, I i'm very resentful i think of that attitude when i see like i have 820 staff and i see the work they put into the interest the way they attend their cpd the way the the passion they feel for their children and the love that they demonstrate and then there is no proper framework for them to work to yeah. uh and that's wrong that's fundamentally wrong and that says something about our attitude to our children as well yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're, you're so right. You're so right. Yeah. We'll keep campaigning for that to change because it's not good. Absolutely. So no. um, going back to um, co-regulation. Yeah. And, uh, just, I've got a few, few more questions we wanted to ask you. And I think this question you probably already answered. Um, just looking at, you know, what, what skills are the sorts of skills that early years teachers need to successfully co-regulate. But you sort of talked a little bit about that, that it is that sort of engaging and empathy and narrating. Are those, what sort of skills would you say a teacher could feel, oh yes, I really, you know, I, I know what I'm doing when I'm co-regulating. Well, I think the first thing is they need to understand and I make this point again, child development. But when, when I say that, I think, you know, they need to understand that the first phase of a child and, you know, the, the, the kind of notion of their, their, how their brain is operating and that what is possible, you know, what is, what, what is possible to, to help them and, you know, how they respond, you know, they're little and they have flight or fight, you know, what does that look like in terms of behavior? So I think that's the first thing they need to be able to do is describe 
the kind of thing um the sets of behaviors the um the emotional kind of range that those children have at different ages so that they're not surprised when this behavior occurs and that therefore they they know that there are techniques or our tactics that will will help you know that, that there are you know and so that's the first thing i think the second thing is i need to understand um techniques around language and communication because i mean part of this um regulation is around how we help children to find words to do to manage that um we use a lot of makaton for our small children because we have done for a long time now because it just gives them i think a hook sometimes to be able to describe how they're feeling and you know the language we use often, particularly, I feel sorry for two-year-olds. They get really bad press. They do, you know, terrible twos, you know, tame toddler taming, uh, all that kind of negative language, which is really just a failure to describe the the um, developmental stages the two-year-old is going through, and us creating an environment that actually helps them to manipulate and to manage that. So that's the second thing. So they need to understand about communication and about language and frustration when you can't describe how you feel and therefore what you can do to help that. And then the third thing I think they need to really understand is the environment. How do you create an environment which in a way mitigates um, uh, the sort of uh, tensions and anxieties that, that are provoked in children? So whether it's, um, too much clutter, are too much, too busy, too noisy, um, too regimented, to the opposite, you know, um, whether it's uh, accessible, that they can find things, they can put things away, whether you have a clear timetable, whether it's, you know, it, it describes the day because you use a visual timetable, but, you know, the environment is a third teacher, and it really does need to um, be designed in a way that takes account of children's emotional needs. And, and then you wrap that up in an understanding of the routine. So, you know, many children struggle with change in the day, you know, and you should know that. And therefore, you have preparation tactics, you know, we're going to come in soon, children, it'll be lunchtime soon, you know, all of those things you know that that you know are designed to take account of the fact that you're recognizing there are points of stress for every child and that you know some things uh can be helped by creating an environment and a routine that makes them feel secure and safe and they can figure it out especially if they're coming and they don't speak english or they don't speak at all or they're coming and they're 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 finding separation quite hard their anxiety is 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 harder so you know i think the environment is 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 quite significant and the routine which is often misunderstood is actually critical i think to staff then understanding how to to manage children's uh, needs you know a point that drives me absolutely crazy and causes stress for children that's unnecessary is this waiting business oh, yeah. you know i say to the staff why are they all queuing up to go outside that they've oh because we have to wait for nathan to put his coat on why are we all waiting for nathan to put his coat on <laughs> when you know the first six children have got their coats on you've you know there's enough staff there take them out you know why are they all being told to wait nicely and queue up nicely and stuff no. and they're all twisting and turning and you know and their their bodies are all wriggling and yeah. they're all you know they're all kind of jittery and stuff and they want to get out and they will feel you know marvelous when they're out in the in the air and the space and everything else and you're all waiting for poor Nathan to put his coat on <laughs> um, and you could be outside you find that a lot and when you actually raise that with staff they look at you first and like oh gosh what's she on about now and then they think about it and they say you're absolutely right mm -hmm. and you i call that dead time and there's dead time in the day you know what is it about going to the toilet that they all have to go at the same time so you have the toilet which is often the small space they're all queuing to try and get in and wash their hands and everything else and then there's kind of inevitably some kind of stress point goes on in there yeah. and somebody gets pushed and somebody gets upset and somebody gets wound up and this is often before lunch or before they have a snooze so they're often already fairly fraught and so we have this business of them all having to go to the loo at the same time and you think why would you do that and so you know um i often say well can we rethink this can we rethink the way we do these kind of things because these are points that are going to cause children to get stressed and negatively stressed and you know they're never going to learn to manage this if we don't help them by providing a routine and a set of behaviors 
that's going to actually prepare them. You know, we're going to the bathroom in a minute, children, and we're going to go in the first six out of all the children with this name or whatever it is, um, and we'll do that. Um, and the rest of you, this is what you can do, and this is what you can do. And then the other point of, of tension is the four o'clock to six o'clock, where poor little children, especially little two-year-olds, the door starts to ring and the mummies start to arrive and the daddies start to arrive. And, and all they can then think about is the mummies and daddies arrive. When is my mummy coming? And some, for some of them, it's another hour and a half. So what are we doing about that? And we recognize their cortisol levels are probably high. Their tensions are high. So isn't this the time for calm cello music? Isn't this the time for dens? Isn't this the time for storying? Isn't this the time for outside having fun? You know, let's just think about these things. And that's what I expect a nursery teacher to understand in relation to the journey of a child learning to manage those things in a capable way and make use of those things, because it's always not yeah. just a coping thing. It's often a, a stretching thing, too. Yeah. And so that, to me, is, 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 is what they need. And then many of them will have that, but we need to name that for them now. Yes. So that's a step. All of those things lead to an environment where co-regulation is likely to be more successful. And as a consequence of a child co-regulating, they will actually learn to manage themselves and, and, and that sense of metacognition where they can they can find their own way of describing how they help what, what helps them to learn, which is yeah. ultimately the longer term yeah. process. That's so, yeah. true. That's so good. That's true. And yeah. also when you're talking about you know queuing up and all the waiting and all that stressful time during the day, teachers, you know, the practitioners are getting a little bit unregulated. Yeah. And then that and that emotional um, contagion that mm. we going on about. You know, it's every everyone's catching it from each other, aren't they? Not good. And okay, I just, um, we're just doing a piece. I'm just doing a a piece of work with our staff, um, which is quite interesting actually. And Lala Manners, I don't know if you know Lala, but she's um, she's a very um, she's very a, a very sensitive teacher and very knowledgeable about how you use your whole body to learn. And I liked that. And I said to her, let's just do some work around the well-being of staff that doesn't look yeah. like Lala is all about fitness and well-being and all that sort of thing. I said to her, that doesn't look like a handbook, but actually takes account of what this, what happens in a nursery anyway and where you naturally learn to um, to uh, to look after yourself because your your part is part of your day. So, for example, you know one of the things that we love to do in in the leaf nurseries is is stretch, and uh, they sometimes uh, call it yoga. I'm sure the yogis of the of the world would be freaked out to see what's oh, yeah, describing yeah. yoga, but it's really about stretching and you know getting in touch with your body and mm. you know paying attention to how you how you breathe and you know. But the thing for me is. That's good for the staff as well. But we don't always name that. We don't yeah. always say this activity is great for the children. But hey, guys, get involved in it yourself because it's good for you too. Yeah. And so I'm looking at all the things we do in the day, the, even the, you know, it, to everything, to the food we serve, to um, the activities we produce, the way we organize the routine. And thinking about where are the also the points that support the, the staff so yeah. that they're not in this business of, you know, you come to work and then you wait till six o'clock in the evening and you go home and then you then you do well-being. Yeah. You know, you wait till you go home and you do a class or something yeah. that actually you're using every bit of your day yeah. to identify your own well-being po points as well. So yeah. that it's a joint story. It's a, it's a yeah. joint experience. And because lots of what we do in the nursery with the children is done for their well-being. So it's got to be good for the staff, too. So we shouldn't box it into two. So Lala is writing that for us so that by the end of this year, we will have a, a handbook with, with loads of examples from the staff about things that make them feel good as well and make them calm down as well, you know, and make them in touch with your heart because, you know, when your heart's beating because, you know, you're, 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 you're thinking, you know, people are looking at me. My table is not, you know, um, my table isn't calm. You know, my children aren't happy. Look over there, Rosie, you know, her table are all really happy and her children are all singing and it's all very calm. And mine are all like all tense and, you know, pushing and stuff. And oh, is it because I'm less experienced than her? Oh, you know, you can feel it. And then by the end, all the children have all this. You're like, you're the whole lot, the whole lot of you are all kind of contagiously rosy. Yes. And, and so it's just, you know, I just feel... Um, we just sometimes need to name all of this stuff and, and and pay attention to it and not frame it as something you have to do because now Ofsted come up with it or, you know, the DFE have come out with this. But actually, it's about 
really enjoying being a nursery in a nursery or a childminder or a, a preschool and just l- loving the moments you have with those children yes. yeah and, and and that feeling that's okay yeah. yeah you know you just don't have to be doing a maths activity or science or jumping up and down or whatever it is you can just be in yeah. that experience with the children and let them lead because when they lead especially four-year-olds you end up in very very interesting places yes yeah couldn't agree more i think that's <laughs> so good and what that. some great great bits of advice there i, I love, love it, it. Yeah I, yeah, I remember just loving, I love reading to children. It's one of my favourite things. So when I was tired, because you, we get tired in the day, don't we? Yeah, exhausted. Like, exhausted. So just I would just go and sit in the reading corner and open a book. And within about two minutes, I was sort of covered with children. And we were yeah. reading a book. And we would read about 16, I think 16 books was the, was the record. record. Wow. And just carried on. And I think staff were looking at me like, is she actually going to do anything today? That, you know, I did have yeah. that feeling. But I thought, no, it's, this is good. This is good. I'm doing a good thing here. And so yeah, I'm- that's it. Very interesting. Is she going to do anything? And the other thing is staff sometimes are resistant, are reluctant. Are, I mean, I think with confidence, all this comes and, and a culture, a culture in your in your setting that allows this. But just to have some humour. Yes. yes. There's yes. nothing better to oh. break the ice and to solve yeah. a tension by having some funny things, saying something funny, yes. doing something funny, and they love it. And that gives them permission to kind of relax themselves and everybody has a jolly time. Exactly. Absolutely. Laughter models, be a laughter model. I could yeah. not agree more. I couldn't yeah. agree. Um, do you think, June, it's possible to over co-regulate or over protect? You know, does this impact the child's ability to independently self-regulate? Haven't we just created a whole generation of, of helicoptered cotton wool children? Yes. Um, completely and utterly. And that's the health and safety thing. I, I mean, I say that to, to, to the least of. Health and safety, guys, is to mitigate risk. It's not to eradicate it. Yeah. And if you eradicate risk, you know, then in a way you're creating children who can't, who, who will lose their own confidence to trust, trust their own bodies. Yeah, Part yeah. of self-regulation is about trusting what, you know, what you can do. Most children will make, pretty good judgments about how far they can jump how far that you know when they need a hand to ha- to hold when they need to get out of a, a tunnel that they're feeling anxious about they, they're pretty pretty good at, 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 at you know connecting with their own instinct yet we're all you know don't do this and be careful and hold on and oh we can't have that and oh my gosh that tree is too high and oh, what about health and safety and what if they fall and and we've created an environment and um parents haven't helped with um you know with with this whole business of you know suing people and you know if they fall we'll be in trouble and you know I remember when I was growing up in a, a very um, relaxed kind of way, as we were in the 70s, and your biggest achievement was how many scabs did you have on your knee? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was a point of, like, that was a point of honour. Oh, yeah. I've got a really big one down the side. You know, have you seen that one? Where did you get that from? Oh, I don't know. But, you know, did anyone worry about these things? Did anyone think their leg was going to fall off? No. Yeah. Um, and so we have we have created this and, and then we have manipulated their environments for them. So the so-called risk is like something we bought from a shop. You know, that kind of looks like a, uh, something you can climb into and it looks a bit, you know, crazy. But actually, watch the children if you have a garden. We have in some of our nurseries, we have very little garden and some of our nurseries, we have great big ones. So watch the children in a big, spacious garden. Well, just watch them. Just watch mm-hmm. them. Just follow them. And their game is riskier. It's more fun. It's mm-hmm. more um, it's more uh, kind of pressured in some ways. And it, it provides more extension and stretch for them than us setting up everything all the time. And we just have to be braver about that. And we have to really take advocate for children because we have created a completely um you know overprotected uh unhelpful um and um i think boring environment for them yeah Um, absolutely boring you know um and you know what happened to just throwing a whole heap of you know cardboard boxes in the middle of the grass and let them get on with it yeah yeah oh we had a great chat with um, a lady called daisy turnbull who wrote a book, um, 50 Risks to Take with Your Children. Oh, nice. He was talking about the bubble wrap generation. Mm. And just like this, talking about how we have got, children will never be able to manage risks if you never allow them to experience 
wrists and it was just such a good conversation it was, wasn't it it was really good it was like don't, don't you think that some of the stuff that you know is is kind of often considered um uh, slightly wokest these days but you know with that sense of uh, so many people needing safe spaces, um, feeling anxious about things, you know, the increase in mental ill health and all that sort of thing. Do you not think that there might be a link back to some of their, uh, you know, the kind of environment that was created for them when they were children and, um, you know, in, in, in well-meaningly, mm -hmm. but actually maybe there is something about their old levels of anxiety and stuff went up higher. They didn't kind of find a way of managing that better yeah. and, and didn't have that, you know, tussle that you have to have because, you know, when children play, which is kind of something we're trying to take away from them, even though it's their innate right and important and, yeah. and centrally important to their development. Um, people often think of play as nice, fancy playing around, having games, but play is really tough. Yeah, I mean, play is really, really tough, and it's not very nice sometimes mm. because you have to negotiate not joining, not being involved. You know, having to find the rules, having to yeah. work out if you're in or out. Well, all of those things, if that's limited, is going to actually take away a slice of a child's ability to complete their own developmental path. Is it not? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I just wonder about stuff like that. But you know, because everyone thinks working with small children, we're all just sort of nice but dim. We never have these great, deeper philosophical conversations about the impact that it's had. But I always think children are, small children are the litmus test of what's, you know, what's happening all around. And yeah. once we don't test that, once we don't, we don't then, you know, link it back and then have those full conversations, we, um, we miss uh, yeah. significant understanding of our role as adults in supporting our children. And we, we um, fail to recognize the decisions we've made, how they impact on them when they're slightly older. Yeah, yeah, gosh, it's so true. It's so it's true. true. That's so good. It kind of links with my next question a little bit. Um, so, you know, part emotional intelligence, part of that, and self-regulation, that children mm -hmm. learn to recognize their own feelings and emotions and, you know, what they can do and the risks and that, what have you. What strategies do you, have you found in your nursery, your settings, that have worked really well to support children in this. And I know you've got the SOFA, yeah. SOFA policy, SOFA strategy. I love that. The, so, the SOFA pedagogy. SOFA Tell pedagogy. Us Tell us about it. Well, I, I, it takes me back to environment and the power of the environment. And um, I always thought the environment was, was really important. And then I discovered that uh, Loris Malaguzzi from Reggio Emilia said uh, that the environment was the third teacher. So I felt, you know, incredibly delighted that uh, yeah. somebody whose work is, I, I like, um, actually had said something that I was thinking about. So I felt very pleased about that. But, and so, yeah, so I spent a lot of time worrying about the environment. And uh, as you know, I work with um, a lot, I mean, our game really is to, to, to provide really, really good quality, accessible nurseries to children from more disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, and what we found quite often when you go into, to sort of save a nursery and, and I don't mean that in any arrogant way I mean literally you know uh, it's going to go down the pan if you don't do something with it was that um, you found very cluttered very um, overwhelming environments and I used to laugh and say to them is it because you don't think you're ever going to get any more money that you never throw anything out oh, yes. but it struck me that that probably was fundamentally one of the elements but um but I think clutter, you see, is quite dis discordant. And I think it's, it yeah, just yeah. kind of unnerves people. Yeah. And so we began to spend a lot of time looking at the color of walls and floor and how you lay it out and how much is real and how much is plastic and you know, all of that stuff. And we did that about 10, 10 years ago. We introduced like things like trough sinks. There's a hell of a lot of less arguing with yeah. children over the sink if yeah. they're all troughs. Yeah. Um, you know, we discovered from colleagues in Scotland that if you put your display boards as Hessian, it didn't superimpose itself on, on the environment, but also the poor staff weren't stressed out of their brain spending hours in the evening putting borders around to make this the, yeah. the, you know, the displays look a particular way. And so those kind of journey, we've kind of continued on those, those journeys. And, and one of the things that struck me was that actually the sofa was very important in terms of, um, our pedagogy. Now for us, the leaf pedagogy means literally leading to learn. That's what it is. 
mm. and it's got seven strands and they are all interconnected. But the sofa is very important because one, it has to be uh, faux leather because I can't be doing with all that chintz and those covering yeah. the stains and trying to get it out of the stains and having 16 blankets on your on your sofa yeah. to try and cover things. So I love an old faux leather. And then because then you can put blankets on if you want and you can put cushions on and you can do as you please, but that's your basis. And when we observed how children used that and how staff used it, we found that it became like an oasis. Mm -hmm. an oasis of sort of calm so when people were stressed they would crawl up onto the sofa mm -hmm. and then inevitably somebody crawled next to them and yeah. you would find the children having very deep conversations that build friendships for them mm -hmm. um you would find a staff member sort of cuddled up into it and the children would come around her or him and then they'd be on their lap and then inevitably a story or a song or whatever would occur and so to me the sofa became quite a significant part of our pedagogy and we did a piece of research with we do a lot on men and child care i'm sure you're aware of that but yeah. um we did a piece of work on what did the children think about men in child care and we found that generally uh, they didn't really care once you were good at what you were doing they chose you you know so if you were good at skipping and you happen to be a man they'd have you or if you were good at uh, sorting out the dollies and you know you and you were a man they'd have you but and if you were brilliant at football and you were a girl they'd have you you know it, they didn't make a lot of judgments but one of the observations from the researchers which was uh, from the University of Wolverhampton was that because we use the sofas and our male staff are so part of the kind of, you know, the, the softer side of the day and the, the more, um, uh, you know, the more uh, kind of in a way carey sort of side of the, of the day. And the, they were very comfortable on the sofa a lot of the time. They think that was a, that, that may have impacted on the children's perception of their male, male staff and female staff. So the sofa became quite kind of, we're doing some more research on the sofa. Um, we've just done some research on bikes. We should do research on ordinary things in nurseries all the time because of how we, we use them. Because you discover all sorts of things that you hadn't, that you've forgotten or that you didn't pay attention to. And so the sofa is one of those things. And I think it's just one, of, that's just one way of creating uh, something in your environment that gives a ch child a kind of an island where they can kind of be rescued. Um, either they choose to be rescued or they know if they go on there that they will be rescued or that they like it because it's a place where they can develop their friendships and develop their conversations. So, yeah, so the sofa is quite an important part of, of the leaf way, really, to be honest as indeed is, um, you know, uh, training um, and supporting staff to be able to articulate some of this stuff too, which takes a while. Yes, that's so good, isn't so it? Good. Love that. Love it. So, so I mean, we're, we're sort of coming to the end, but just, I think you, the last question was really in line with that because, um, so I have a, a four-year-old grandson and when he used to feel overwhelmed, he would go and sit in a teepee and read a book. Uh -huh. And he knew he had to go there. Well, he, he wanted to go there. He would, you know, find his way there. And I was just re going to ask you really about in your earlier settings, do you have physical structure? But the sofa is obviously part of that physical structure that will help children to understand where they need to go when they feel they need something particular. But it sounds as though you've already got that, which is fantastic. Do, do you have a sofa in every setting? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And in every room. Wow, lovely. So that's um, I mean, some of the rooms are small, so it's a bit of a challenge, but um, we think they're really important. Uh, the baby room might be the only one where we don't fit it in and we kind of create a, a crawly in space. Because yeah. if you can't crawl up into it, you crawl into it. So yeah. I think uh, dens are the other thing. I mean, every nursery needs dens. Yes. Um, and I used to be very furious at... Um, misunderstood um misinformed adults who were worried about you know the inappropriate behavior of the children inside in the den or you know all of that nonsense um and if, yes of course four-year-olds are trying to figure out who they are and what they are and what their body looks like and what it works and how it works like that that is again if you don't know about your child development then you think that there's an issue it's not an issue it's about how they're developing and working things out and so at one point i think there was a big anxiety about having dens but you know we always have had dens it doesn't matter whether they're fancy ones um bought ones um 
the best ones are a corner in the nursery really where like a cupboard that you can create a den with with lots of cushions and stuff um you know i think these are an essential they're they're essential i think for children and i think uh, vis visual timetables are also yes. very important yes. so, good. so they can see what's going to happen next um yeah. Yeah. just in their environment i think that they're important transition items you know again i've heard in some places they don't allow them i think that's pretty scary mm -hmm. uh that you know you you don't want the child to be you know entirely dependent on what my niece would call bappy but you need and bappy might have to go into the basket after a while but there you you do need to connect connect and think well Today isn't a good day for Bappy to be in the basket. Bappy really needs to be on her today. Yes. You know, she needs to have Bappy without where she's going. Um, so I think those kind of things, um, understanding those things. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do, and, and, and my staff in um, who, working in the baby room are going to work with me on this, is we want to look at transitions for co what I call COVID babies, where we've had little babies who joined us wow. throughout COVID, who've really experience the settling in period that's a bit like something out of the handmaid's tale you know so if you were to say to somebody the thing is you arrive with a mask and you hand your little baby over to someone and you can't go into the room with them and you're and she's wearing a mask but you'll take it off when you're inside oh um, and on a good day we'll be able to have you in the garden and we'll show you everything on video and we'll send you pictures and everything else home but effectively we're saying you can't come in mm. you would have shot me down you would have said this is this is this is this is cruel but this is what's happening and yeah. so i want to know if all the things that people have done with the best of intentions you know the warmest of intentions uh like you know you know out you know settling in outdoors videos all of the stuff you know many more conversations with parents all sorts of things that you can possibly do but actually, is this working for, for babies? I want to know, are we doing this? Are we getting it right for them? Are, it, are they showing signs of stress that um, are different because they're not crying and they're settling in? And, you know, are, are we just figuring it out and actually they've kind of adjusted to it and that it's OK adjustment? Or is it they've, they've adjusted to it because they've given up adjustment? You know, all of those things. And I seriously think that we should be paying attention to that and, yeah. and, having, and having a look. Um, at that, and I'm 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 surprised that I'm not the only one banging on about this because I think this this is what would make the sector great in the way where we can we can look at the ordinary, which is you know settling in. That's an ordinary thing because every every child experiences it. We can look at things that we take for granted, like transitions, because they're ordinary things. As I said, we just looked at bikes and found that what we thought bikes were really only about physical development and stuff, that the sociolinguistic element of the bike was much greater than we thought. We kind of knew, we kind of knew there would be some, but you know, much greater. And that the children's ability to use bikes as part of their role play that reflected their home life was much more potent than we thought. Wow. Yes. Uh, and they're, you know, and let, let alone, just observing them, because that's one of the things they had to do, was just observe them, let them go, was that children use their bikes to be very descriptive about their environment. Um, and in one of the nurseries, they discovered the reason the children weren't using the bikes that much was because the AstroTurf, which we had to put in because of the local authority insisting upon it, um, really made it hard to cycle. Yeah, and what yeah. they had done is they turned the bikes over and they were doing quite a lot of work around repairing the bikes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and that, you know, that sort of schematic kind of rotation, yeah. they were really exploring that. Um, and they were, and they created more friendships and more role play around that rather than actually using the bikes themselves. Hey, yeah. that's lovely. I know, and the staff were really surprised by that because they had taken for granted they hadn't they had just not considered why they weren't using the bikes they just thought yeah. oh well they're just not that interested in the yeah, bikes yeah, that's okay yeah. you know and and when they stood back and watched and they saw this they mm. were like astounded and thought you know we've failed these children we could have given them more so now they're taking them out onto the pavement so they're going to cycle around the neighborhood because really? they can because it's it's concrete and that they're doing more um, indoors around kind of giving them role play opportunities but following the children's leads much much more than they would normally um because they had assumed they had to put some kind of provocation in place for the children to get them going what they found was they didn't at all that wow. they they were given some space and given some time, given some um, trust 
yeah. which is key to self-regulation, of course. They, you, you trusted in them to make some judgments and then you, you wrapped it around it. You, you sort of scaffolded around them and let them then stretch themselves in that trusting environment. And the staff were really taken aback at how much they learned. So, exactly. and that all comes, I think, from confident staff. So ultimately all of this is going to be built by us supporting our staff to be confident to understand what we mean by you know how we support and lead the children towards a way of of learning how to manage themselves and you know cope and address things and stretch themselves and extend themselves and all of those things and i think that's what we have to do and i don't i think until we really put some status around our staff and what they do and really appreciate the the stuff they do that they know they don't articulate till you yeah. sit them down and talk about it that actually we're never really going to shift the dial on 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 um, the power of the early years teacher and the influence they can have on um society's children really wow that's brilliant that Jane. is amazing thank you so much that was just so good what real gems there I and really it. helpful love it so much thank you for your time not at all a good a good book to, ta to take away is this uh kate silverton's book uh there's no such thing as naughty oh yeah i love the way kate has made we did a podcast on this and we've also done um uh, we do a book club called prosecco and pedagogy Oh, um, and so the staff had chosen this book, but she Kate uses three animals to describe the sort of the emotion the children, you know, the, and the way the children kind of manage themselves. The the um, the lizard, the baboon, and the owl, which is very interesting that you use the owl too. But of course, the children are nowhere near being owls, so they're owlets. Um, and I, I I think it's a lovely way of describing what she calls emotional regulation. Um, yes. You know, and it, it's it's just it's just a nice way to get people who are maybe not keen to be reading it in a kind of uh, academic uh, textbook way just to read this. It gets to really open up the conversation. That's great, great. lovely. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank not you so much. Not at all. Great. Pleasure. Lovely talking to you as ever, and thank you so much. And also to all our attendees, which is just yes. wonderful to see you all. And um, June, we'll see you soon. Yeah. Okay. Great. Take care. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye. So Go Take and have care. a lovely cup of tea now. Yeah. <laughs> I will. I will actually. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Bye.